chapter 19 and verse 10. Is there an echo coming here? The microphone is pretty intimidating tonight. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. O oh Lord God, may nothing stand between the words of our Lord and the people of God this evening as the word would come from lips clear. We pray for help, Lord, as we stand in the midst of our people. Help them to hear and help me to speak to your glory. Amen. Amen. Luke chapters 18 and 19 records two wonderful miracles of Jesus where he gave sight to two blind men. The title of the message, Two Blind Men. One was naturally blind. The other was spiritually blind. He wanted to see Jesus but he could not. Both blind men are pictures of all men today, all of us. By nature, we are spiritually blind from birth. Others are blinded by their religion and by their sin. And you will learn a few things about Zacchaeus this evening and also Bartimaeus. Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost in fulfillment to Ezekiel 34 verse 16 which says I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away. I will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick, but I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. That's the religious people. Presumably the scribes and the Pharisees. And today, those who are in church and think they're saved. This evening I have entitled the message to blind men because of the context of Luke's narrative. The first blind man in Luke chapter 18, as I said, was naturally blind. The second blind man was blinded by the crowd around him that prevented him from seeing Jesus. And you know this can happen to us today. The company we surround ourselves with may keep us in blindness. Let, let, let me put it a different way. The religion that we surround ourselves with may keep us in spiritual blindness. And some of us came out of dispensationalism. So, so understand what I'm saying. But some are still blind in the church. And we should not only look at this message from an evangelistic perspective, but from a personal perspective. The first blind man called out to Jesus for mercy. The other blind man ran from Jesus and was eventually called by Jesus. Both blind men represent us today. In the context of our study, Jesus is continuing his ascent to Jerusalem in the last week of his ministry on earth. It began in Luke chapter 9, really. The Lord is deliberately going to Jerusalem, which you know, to be crucified. We read in Luke 18, verse 31, then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. 
and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Notice he calls himself by the same title that Ezekiel uses many times. After these words, Jesus entered the city of Jericho, where he encountered the first blind man in Luke 18, 35, and 36. And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging, and hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. Now you know that Jericho is a historical city in Israel. It was the first conquered city in the promised land. Most likely our Lord remembered this city from whence one of his famous ancestors came from, Rahab. He remembered that. He has business to do there at Jericho. Our Lord is there deliberately en route to Jerusalem. He encounters a blind man who is begging. And this is how all people of the world stand in the sight of God. We are spiritually blind and we are spiritual beggars. We are bankrupt. The moment we think we have something to offer for salvation, we are on the wrong path. Two other Gospels record this encounter. This first one. Mark 10, 46 identifies this blind man as Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Matthew identified two blind men. I don't think it is a contradiction. It could have been that Bartimaeus was with his father. We read in Matthew 20, 29 and 30, these words. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, Two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Now this blind man also in Luke, the same person, one of them, rightly identified Jesus as not the son of God, but the son of David not a son of David, but the son of David, like I shared with you last week. This shows that he recognizes Jesus to be Israel's Messiah, something that the average religious rabbi failed to confess. It could have been that this blind man may have already been saved. The third thing about this first blind man in Jericho is that he honestly recognized his need. When Jesus asked, what do you want me to do unto you? The blind man said in verse 41, Lord, Lord, it's very hard for some people to say this, that I may receive my sight. This is what gave me the, the insight to believe that this one was on his way to salvation. This man may have already been God, had dealings with God, having been able to make these remarkable assessments of Jesus, son of David, Lord. The fourth thing we observe about this first blind man was his faith. Verse 42, Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith have saved thee. And we see all of these things coming out. And it was not his personal faith 
that save him. No one has that. It was imputed faith that Jesus gave to him to call him correctly. It would be unscriptural to say it was his faith that saved him. And you have been here long enough to know that. It's the faith given by Christ. We know that no man is justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. But we want to consider our second blind man, where we read about in the text. The narrative did not say that he was physically blind, but the implication shows his spiritual blindness. And this is what I want to speak about in the next couple of minutes. Zacchaeus was restricted by limitations. He was rich by distinction, but little by definition. A few days ago, one of our brothers stood here and we heard that when one read their Bibles, they ought to see Jesus. And that's correct. But when we hear the scripture explain, we ought to see Jesus also. And some of us may be like Zacchaeus tonight. We can't see him because we still have limitations. The first thing we want to consider in this narrative even going back to the prior one, is the single word head, man. Luke 19, 1 and 2. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Back in Luke 18, 35, we were told that Jesus came near unto Jericho. Here in Luke 19, 1 and 2, we're told he enters Jericho and meet another man. He enters Jericho now. And whenever the Bible speaks about man, whether it be Anna or Antropos, you and I should always consider two things about man. One, man is a fallen, sinful creature. In our natural facu faculties, we hate God. And we hate him actively, with a passion. We do not want him in our lives. We may pay lip service to him, but we do not want to follow him. It is very hard for some people in the church to follow ecclesiastical instructions. And it is a sign that they don't want to follow divine instructions. It's a hard job to instruct people in a local church. Man. The name Zacchaeus means righteous one. This man was not living up to his name. He was chief among publicans and he was rich. We all know what publicans were. There were Jews, Nathaniel. There were Jews who collected taxes from their own peers, people, for the Roman government. Now you have the definition of a publican. Zacchaeus was looked upon not only as a sinner, but a traitor in the eyes of his peers. The publicans were known as extortioners. You remember when the Pharisee prayed, he said, I thank you that I am not like other men. And he began to enumerate the sins. And then he says, even as this publican, an extortioner. 
But Jesus did not see him that way. Jesus saw his need because he is man. Zacchaeus is a picture of man in need of a savior. He's a picture of you this evening. He was blinded by two things. One, his inability to see Jesus. Two, his inability to see himself. He was blinded by his own sin. Verse 2 says, he was chief among publicans. This statement shows his company, the company he was in. He was among a company of sinners. And I often wonder about some Christians and their company that they keep. They, they seem to, to have a closer bond with the lost people of this world. I was telling the man yesterday, it would be good if we can get together New Year's Eve or a small group. Whoever would want to come, because I know some people, yeah, I know. And, and just spend the time and space and maybe have a, a sandwich or something so that we can pass the time with the Lord. This is my company. But some people will more rather spend time with the unsaved crowd in such a time like this. But when I'm taking note of he was among a company of sinners, remember, you always hear a man is known by the company he keeps. And that's so true, who you're close to. Before a person comes to know the Lord's grace, they are among a company of sinners. Most of them forsake me anyhow. God, one of my best friends come to New York City every week from Pennsylvania and he, he never calls me. The Apostle Paul says, we walk according to the course of this world, among whom also we all had our conduct in times past, in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That was our company. It should not be our company now. Let me ask you a question. Do you still walk in this way? Or are you in a huff to get out, to get with your company? Like the lost men in the world, Paul said to many in the church at Corinth, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual people, but carnal, for you are still carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men, man, unsaved man? We can be in the church and still fit the description of the natural man that I'm discussing. Verse 3 continues, showing the man. And he sought to see Jesus who he was. And by the way, a lot of people in the church, as unsafe as they are, are still curious. A lot of them listen to me out of curiosity. He sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was little of stature. Sister Lucy, and I want to bring back any memories to you at this time there, but I remember your son when he was at Bible Club. Somebody asked him to define Zacchaeus. This was him one year. And your son said, Zacchaeus was a midget who wanted to see Jesus and he couldn't. He was correct. That was true. So you think I don't remember people and what they say, huh? 
I do. You and I must be careful that we are not being hindered by those who will keep us in blindness. It could be our family, it could be our children, it could be our parents. We may be surrounded by people who are keeping us blind. People like to do this. As I said, a man is known by the company he keeps. Many in churches today claim to be converted and find more joy running with the old crowd, maybe from their family, than with Christ's crowd. And these are important lessons, brethren, that I'm bringing out. This is one application we can make here. Verse 4 says, And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Notice that Zacchaeus broke away from the crowd. He cut loose from them. It's another lesson. He separated himself from the press. And this is another application that you can make to break loose from that crowd that is hindering you from the gospel. Sometimes you may have to stand alone. I had to stand alone in a lot of things. Ostracized. Criticized. Because of the doctrines of grace. And the sovereignty of God. The eyelids went up. Call a heretic. You may have to break loose. From the crowd. We see man. We see number two. We see the son of man. Jesus called himself the son of man. The term is an acclamation of the Lord's divinity. The son of God became the son of man. And here I would just share a few of his attributes quickly. Verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. The Son of Man is all-knowing. He knew exactly where to find his elect. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Zacchaeus is one. He knows them by name. Zacchaeus, come down. How did Jesus know this man's name? When this man was running all of his life. You and I are like Zacchaeus. We want to see Jesus. But we do not want Jesus to see us. And many of you can be very evasive. And I always speak to our man that I can't stand evasiveness trying to trick me, trying to pull the wool over my eye, trying to tell me something that is not altogether true. You can't work with men together like that. Let's be transparent, man. Sometimes we're going away and we don't know when we're leaving and when we're coming back. Is that the way it should be? How would you like me to say to you, brethren, I won't be here next week and the week after. And that's it. You should look for a pastor. And one of the requirements of a pastor is that you must be transparent. Above reproach. Not perfect. It's our sin that keeps us this way, running. The Son of Man is also all powerful. He said unto Zacchaeus, to him, make haste and come down. 
for today I must abide at thy house. All powerful. Notice that the Lord did not give the sinner an option or a condition. He gave him a command. I'm not going to tell you if you would accept Jesus, you'll be saved. Nonsense. The Bible does not teach that. Make haste and come down. For today I must abide at thy house. Anytime Jesus said he must do something. It is because he is able to do it. Today I must come at your house. In other words, I must bring salvation to you today. Not next week. There you have it. If you didn't believe it before calling, there it is. Plain and simple. You say, but how come I didn't see that? Because God didn't want you to see it till tonight. The Bible says in verse 6, And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Reformers call this irresistible grace. Brother Nigel, you've heard that before. Good. We are the one that is being drawn to Christ. The one being saved will not resist the internal call of the Savior. Not only would he not resist, he comes joyfully. How did you come to Christ? As a matter of fact, how do you come to church? You don't, you, do you come joyfully or grudgingly? You want to go to church again? Pastor said that you should be at church. That's not conversion. That's compliance. You know, the, the prophet Isaiah says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Joy. It's not only joy in salvation, there's joy in service to God. There's joy, Angela. There's joy in service. You come over here from Elizabeth with joy. Hopefully, it is joy that drives me to drive across the Gothel's Bridge. When we read these things, we cannot help but seeing how far away many people are from the gospel and from Christ. Far, far away. They don't match these things. It's not true of them. What these two blind men did not know is that the Lord planned this route. In going to Jerusalem, Jericho was on his radar screen before he left heaven. Just like how Samaria was on his screen, I must go through Samaria. He had another stop to make before Calvary. Son of man has come to seek, to save that which was lost. Oh, brethren, oh, brethren, you're looking at a man that was desperately lost, desperately lost, love sin. We need to thank God for this text. Verse 7, and when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone in to be guests with a man that is a sinner. Now these ones who murmured, like what Brother Depo was talking about this morning, were part of the crowd that was blocking Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus. They were following the multitude, but they were also blocking. First, they sought to derail the first blind man in Luke 18, 39, from crying to Jesus, and they which went before 
rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You know, you would hear your loved ones and your friends says, but why do you make such a big deal about church? Why, 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 why the fuss? What, why it is that you must go so regularly? What's, what's the big deal? Can you just stop short there? Here in chapter 19, they murmured. And there is always the pessimist in every given congregation. This, 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 this pandemic is something else. Don't, don't go near you, you might get that. Don't, don't go. And most of the people that tell you that do not care anything about the gospel. A godly man who says you should go, but as you go, take the precautions. And that's what every pastor that I associate with, I heard them say. You may not hear the pessimists yourself, but rest assured they are there as a hindrance to the progress of the gospel. Be careful who you surround yourself with. These ones were preventing Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus. And, and there are many ways in which people can deter others from coming to the Savior. Let us not think that this is only done in a verbal manner. We can be discouragers to those who are seeking to be faithful with our very unfaithfulness. I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. By people looking at our unfaithfulness, they can become discouraged to be unfaithful. Like, if so-and-so do it, why can't I do it? And that's why that is very dangerous. We can put stumbling blocks in the path of those who are weak by the things we do in the name of liberty. Remember what Paul said to the Corinthians? But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. And a lot of things that I would not do is because of the church and the people I serve. A lot of places I would not go because of what you may think of me. Not that I can't go, but I would not go because of what you may think of me. You'll be surprised if you're, and he's a pastor. And therefore I try to put limitations, and my wife too, from going certain places, doing certain things, or wearing certain clothes. No, don't do it. You have the liberty, but don't do it. We have seen so far in this text, man, mankind in general, spiritually blind, among our own company, sinners, Zacchaeus was among his peers. We saw Son of Man, Jesus, all-knowing, all-powerful, irresistible to his elect. We mark those things out. We come to the last head. Salvation of man. Verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him for fall. Now, Zacchaeus is saying this is what he would do uh, as he seeks to, what was the word? The, what was it? Restitution. Uh, that's what he's seeking. But what we notice here is some wonderful changes that took place in this man. And uh, let me ask you, have these wonderful changes took place in your life? C can you see them? 
Can, can you see these things in your life? Uh, let me share it with you quickly. They are relative to a saved man. First, he stood. The Bible said before he ran. He ran with the publicans. He ran from Jesus. He ran to see Jesus. Now he stands with Jesus. He's now on solid footing. He, he doesn't have to be shady anymore. He stands with the perfect son of God. It's a powerful word. It reminds us of Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Salvation puts a person in a right standing before God. We don't have to run from him anymore because we are right with him. Sin and religion keeps us running with the crowd and away from God. Brother, be encouraged with this here. It should, shed, it should shed, shed clarity on the situation you're facing. It's the Bible. Zacchaeus here stands in the presence of his Lord and addresses him in that manner. Lord, half of my goods I'll give to the poor. He seeks rest, restribu restribution to those he robbed. We can't do that today. To, I remember when I was first year as a convert, and I was going back telling people, oh, I'm sorry that I mistreated them. And tell them. I would be still doing it if I had continued that. But somebody said, well, you don't have to do that. You don't have to go back and apologize to the people you wronged. Um, money was stole. People you led in astray. But you seek retribution with God. You, you confess your sins. You, you repent of your sin. And this, this is what he's doing. He's repenting. Second, Zacchaeus seeks to honor the word of God. He remembered Exodus 22 verse 1. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it. He shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. That's why Zacchaeus wanted to restore four four. He read the law. Apparently this man lived a life of theft and sought to stop, sought to be obedient to the law of God. The law of God never challenges the grace of God. It complements it. The law is meant to bring us to Christ. And here the Lord Jesus tells us why this man became this way in verse 9. Jesus said to him, This day is salvation come to this house. Now, it is very interesting that when God saved a person, that the possibility is that salvation may come to that house. Zacchaeus became saved. And now Zacchaeus now is the influence in his house just like what 1 Corinthians 7 teaches that the unsaved spouse and children are sanctified by the saved and it tells me that the saved person in his house must act as though they are saved because Jesus gives a promise salvation is come to this house The Lord went on 
to say, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. Now, Zacchaeus may have been of the descendants of Abraham. I said he's a Jew, but he was a publican. But Jesus is not talking about his national heritage. He's talking about the true sons of Abraham, as Galatians teaches us, by faith in the Lord Jesus. And that's the reason why Jesus came. To save the seed of Abraham. The son of David, like we said last week. Here we see the covenant born between the Savior and the Son. Zacchaeus is now called the Son. Luke's narrative defines him as the publican. Jesus defines him as the Son of Abraham. No longer a slave. To his occupation, to his passions, but a son who delights in the law of God. How many are like this? Or like Brother Collins said, where are the nine? The one who came back was a Samaritan. Brethren, these are some things to reflect on this evening. A converted person. I would want to fit into each one of these categories tonight with you. I would desperately want to be, to be part of this. To be standing with Christ. To be honoring his word. To be called a son of God and not a slave of sin. Luke 19 is a wonderful text. And sometimes you cannot read an account without not reading the one that went before and after. You come up with error. The two go together. It shows us ourselves. We are totally depraved by nature. We are blinded by our sin and by our company, those around us that we like to be with, who are not interested in the Savior, but are hindrances to Christ. You may be with some of them at this very moment. They have no interest in the gospel. You need to break away, run to see Jesus. You got to run a long way. You may even have to go up in a tree. But rest assured, he's able to call you down. And you come down joyfully. You give up your sins joyfully. We see the Savior. He comes to our depraved state and calls us away and out of sheer delight we run to him for mercy and begin naming our sins to him naming them Lord I'll change I'll change Lord work with me don't give up on me work with me I spread out all the time now Lord, work with me. Lord, don't abandon me. Work in my life. We saw what salvation is like in this text. We stand with him. We acknowledge the very law we spurn and hate it. We seek to do right, righteousness. Are these things true, brethren of you? Are these things true? Or are you running? Or are you standing with him? To stand means a whole lot, you know. 
we don't only stand with him, we stand for him. We might get into some trouble standing for Christ. Are you restoring that which you have stolen? The time, especially his Sabbath, that you have stolen. Teeth. You need to stop it. Breaking the law. His worship. There are changes in the life of a saved person. Do you see them? You should look for them. But you should praise God for them. But the press me. Let's close. This is a lesson. Two blind, not mice, men. Two blind men were given sight to see. Look at them again. Carefully. Our Father, we thank you for the word of God. It is ever fresh in our hands, in our minds. We trust that it bring encouragement to those who have listened. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.